With the European elections looming over the horizon, the European Union faces a pivotal crossroads over the next five years. Will we see the EU take steps towards a fully integrated union, marked by a consolidated fiscal policy, a harmonized immigration policy, and maybe even a unified European army? Or could the balance shift towards strengthened nation states, where the EU remains a free trade zone, but starts rolling back integration in other areas? This video will address all of these questions and look at the six possible scenarios of what the EU could become, how the European parties align with each of these six scenarios, and lastly, what we at the EU Made Simple think will likely happen in the future. To analyze the potential evolution of the EU, we aim to explore six possible directions the Union could take in the future. This approach is inspired by the previous Commission President, who asked the very same question back in 2017. For long-term watchers of my channel, you will have seen these scenarios before in a previous video, but we will go into significantly more detail today. The first scenario is simple. The EU carries on with its current course of action, only making incremental improvements to existing policies and institutions. This approach avoids drastic changes and reform, favoring steadiness and continuity. To make this a bit more tangible, let's look at the EU's competency areas. Firstly, there are the EU's exclusive competencies. Here the EU, and the EU alone, is able to pass laws, and the role of member states is limited to applying the law, unless the EU authorizes them to adopt certain laws themselves. This includes the customs union, competition rules, monetary policy, trade, and marine plants and animals. Next, we have shared competencies, where both the EU and member states are able to pass laws. But member states can only do so if the EU has not already proposed a law. On the screen, you can see a full list of shared competencies, including transport, migration, and energy. Then we have supporting competencies, where the EU can only support, coordinate, or complement the actions of member states. It has no power to pass laws and may not interfere with member countries' ability to do so. See the full list on the screen, including tourism, culture, and public health. Lastly, we have the special competencies, which allow the EU unique roles or actions beyond standard treaty permissions. This includes economic and employment policy and common foreign and security policy. Now, in terms of the first scenario, carrying on, not a lot would change. The competencies would largely remain split among these four categories. The EU could shift focus to immediate challenges, such as immigration and global warming, without undergoing any major reform, however. To make it easier to understand, because after all, we are the EU made simple, we would like to plot this on a graph. On the vertical axis, from integration to disintegration, essentially illustrating whether a scenario leans towards empowering the EU or its member states. And on the horizontal axis, will represent a range from uniformity to differentiation, highlighting if the scenario advocates for a cohesive EU evolution or a multi-speed approach. We believe scenario one will be positioned near the center of the graph, with a slight tilt towards integration. Why? Well, the EU is gradually integrating in areas like climate change, immigration, and foreign policy, notably with its unified stance on Russia. Furthermore, the EU doesn't operate uniformly in all areas. There is already a differentiated approach with aspects like the Eurozone and Schengen. To summarize, scenario one provides stability and predictability. Yet it may slow down the EU's response to geopolitical crises and hinder its unified stance towards global powers like China and the US. With that being said, let's move to the second scenario, which is nothing but the single market. This would mean disintegration in some areas and uniformity in others, thus sitting in the bottom right quadrant of our graph. In this scenario, the EU reverts to its foundational principles, concentrating primarily on deepening and perfecting the single market. Essentially, the overarching philosophy of this approach is to prioritize economic interests while minimizing political entanglements. If we look at the EU's competency map, political integration and more comprehensive cooperation in areas like defense, energy and environment might take a back seat. Economic cooperation becomes the core focus. Therefore, we might see most shared competencies move back to the member states. The main benefit of this approach is that it might enhance the EU's economic competitiveness, as the EU still has some way to go to match powerhouses like the United States and China. Additionally, it could simplify Brussels' administrative processes. 
However, this narrowed focus might neglect crucial geopolitical matters, like Russia's invasion into Ukraine, possibly leaving the EU disjointed and vulnerable against external challenges. This brings us to the third scenario. Those who want to do more, do more. This scenario would mean differentiated integration, sitting in the top left quadrant of our graph. Here the EU adopts a flexible approach, wherein member states that wish to pursue deeper integration or cooperation in specific areas are free to do so, while others can choose to abstain or participate less intensively. This essentially creates a multi-speed Europe. For example, if we look at the EU's competency map, a core group of countries may advance faster in areas like defense or financial policies, while others remain in a looser association. When we look at monetary policy, this has essentially already happened, as only 20 out of the 27 member states are part of the Eurozone and use the Euro currency. In terms of benefits and drawbacks, this scenario's flexibility respects member states' unique aspirations, fostering faster decision-making with aligned groups. However, it could lead to perceived divisions in the EU and challenge its overall unity, with complexities arising from managing multiple groups. A quick interlude with an exciting announcement. We are completely restructuring our Patreon with five revamped levels of engagement. Level 1, Citizen, a wonderful way to show your love and support for our channel. Become a citizen now by going to the Patreon link in the description. Level 2, Ambassador, alongside supporting us, gain basic access to our exclusive Discord community. Level 3, MEP, and get a special mention in the end titles of our videos. Level 4, Commissioner, boost your involvement with advanced Discord access and get early video access. And Level 5, President, the ultimate show of support. This tier is all about unwavering commitment to the channel, and for that you have our deepest gratitude. Producing these detailed and immersive videos is both time intensive and costly. Your contribution, no matter how small, is immensely appreciated, as it helps us continue our work. Join us on our Patreon adventure, link is in the description, and a massive thank you for being the heartbeat of this wonderful community. Then there's the fourth scenario, which is doing less, more efficiently. This scenario would land in the bottom right quadrant of our graph. Here the EU would choose to focus its energies on a narrower set of priorities, ensuring that it can deliver more efficiently on its commitments. Other areas might be left to the discretion of individual member states or deprioritized on the EU agenda. The principle here is about ensuring depth over breadth. If we look at our competency map, for example, the EU could reduce its intervention in agriculture, fisheries, and the environment where the EU's approach has already been criticized for being too complex, bureaucratic, and costly. In terms of benefits and drawbacks, Scenario 4 allows the EU to operate with enhanced efficiency and expertise in chosen domains, potentially reducing bureaucracy and ensuring quicker decisions. However, just like Scenario 2, this narrowed focus might neglect crucial geopolitical matters, like Russia's invasion into Ukraine. Then there's Scenario 5, doing much more together. This scenario sits in the top right quadrant of our graph, indicating uniform EU integration. It portrays a centralized Europe with aligned values and collective decision-making, leading to more authoritative EU institutions as national powers shift to the European level. On our competency map, this suggests a greater shift of responsibilities to the EU level, particularly in areas like foreign and fiscal policy. For example, a fiscal union, centralizing EU fund collection and allocation, or even the establishment of a united European defense force. In terms of benefits and drawbacks, Scenario 5 bolsters the EU's global influence through a unified stance and harmonized policies. But this deepened integration could be perceived as eroding national sovereignty and potentially neglecting the distinct needs of individual member states. Lastly, there's Scenario 6, back to the nation states. This scenario would land in the bottom left quadrant of our graph, differentiated disintegration, which would pretty much mean the end of the EU. In terms of our competency map, this would mean that all the competencies would be removed from the EU and given back to the nation states. So now that we've explored the six scenarios, the question becomes, which scenario will the EU most likely head towards, especially after the European Parliament elections in June next year? To analyze where the EU might be in 2029, we need to understand who will be in power in the European Parliament over the next five years. 
As a reminder, the European Parliament consists of seven major political groups that consist of coalitions of like-minded parties from the 27 member states. For a more detailed explanation, please refer to the video above. Currently, the EPP, SND and Renew have the most seats in the European Parliament and therefore can shape a lot of the EU legislation. However, amid the recent wave of right-wing populism across the EU, Polls from Politico suggest that the ECR and IND are poised to secure the highest gains in new seats in next year's elections. Both these groups lean Eurosceptic, but differ in their vision and ideological positioning. The right-wing ECR emphasizes EU reform that upholds national sovereignty and is critical of deeper political integration. However, they do advocate for an EU that efficiently manages select areas of shared benefit therefore loosely aligning to scenario 4, doing less, more efficiently. Meanwhile, the IND, situated further to the right with strong nationalist and populist roots, envisions the EU primarily as an economic entity. Their viewpoint resonates most with scenario 2, nothing but the single market, preferring an EU that focuses solely on the single market with very limited political integration. For the other EU parties, it becomes even more challenging to neatly align them with specific scenarios, as they often have nuanced stances in different policy areas that can change drastically over time. Therefore, the associations below are broad generalizations, so consider them as rough guides rather than strict classifications. The EPP is a center-right party that supports a strong and unified EU. They advocate for more qualified majority voting, a stronger EU parliament, and a stronger EU defense policy. However, with the rise of right-wing factions within its ranks, some within the EPP have become more hesitant towards deeper EU integration. Thus, the EPP currently aligns closest with scenario one, carrying on. Then there's the SND, a center-left party advocating for a more social and just EU. Their priorities are social justice and cohesion, environment and climate action, and the rule of law and democracy. Historically, the SND has been more favorable towards European integration compared to the EPP. They traditionally push for deeper political ties among EU states, especially in social and workers' rights areas. Therefore, the SND also aligns with scenario one, but with slightly more European integration. In terms of differentiated versus uniform, both EPP and the SND have members favoring a multi-speed Europe. Yet the EP's diverse membership might make it more open to differentiated integration as a way to progress the EU. Then there's Renew, a centrist liberal group that traditionally champions deeper European integration. With Macron's Renaissance Party as a key member, they loosely align with scenario three, those who want more, do more. This is because Macron is a strong supporter of a multi-speed EU and his efforts in establishing a European political community might be the first step towards a multi-tiered EU. Next, we have the Green slash EFA, representing environmentalist and minority rights agendas. They are likely to align closest with Scenario 5, doing much more together, focusing on collective action to address global challenges, especially environmental ones. Then the left-wing group prioritizes social justice and anti-austerity, while they might not fit neatly into any one of the scenarios, they could lean towards scenario 5, doing much more together, but purely with a focus on more equitable and social policies across the EU. Here's what we think. Even though the ECR and IND might gain a number of seats, the EPP is still likely to win more seats than both the ECR and the IND combined. And with the SND likely to win the second most seats, scenario 1 looks like the most realistic option for now. Thus, we might see some further European integration over the coming years, most notably the creation of a more unified European defense policy, something the EPP has advocated for for years. If the EPP wins the most seats in the European Parliament, they will most likely also get to choose the Commission President. This will give them some power towards making their agenda a reality. Most importantly, find out which party in your country is part of which EU political group so that you can vote for your interests in the elections next year. And let us know in the comments which scenario you prefer. Thanks for watching and please subscribe to the channel and like the video. And if you want to support us further, please sign up to Patreon. Until next time.